Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's edition of the MotorOne.com podcast. We have a very special show for you this week. Welcome to the show, MotorOne.com, employee number one, former executive editor, Seth Mirzma. Seth, welcome back. Hello, it's so good to be back. I've enjoyed listening to the podcast, and I'm uh, stoked to be a part of it now. So you've been gone from the site for over a year now, and during that time, um, your life has changed, gotten a lot better. You had a kid, you had a baby Seth, mm-hmm. and you reached out to me last week because you're in the process of selling your your pre-baby car, which is a Porsche Boxster, uh, and buying something more kid-friendly. And like the old days, you suggested a good old-fashioned editor versus editor throwdown to help you come up with ideas of what car you can buy to replace your Boxster. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, also joining us is show regular and MotorOne.com writer Christopher Smith. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing great, and I'm so looking forward to telling Seth how wrong he is on all of his opinions. <laughs> That's exactly what editor versus editor is about. So one key thing that we learned a long time ago is that when we have these editor versus editor battles, it's very important to get the rules straight. So Seth, since it was your idea, you got to claim the rules. Do you have them in front of you, or do you want me to go through them? We won't go into the many bylaws that uh, I think you guys... <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the, the goal here is to create uh, or to come up with a fun dad mobile. Oh, we'll start with the definition of fun, which is that it's got to have a manual transmission and or it has to be an engine that's uh, at least eight cylinders and or be rear wheel, rear wheel drive and or be a convertible. So what we're trying to avoid here is the, and I won't point any fingers or name any names, but the idea that says, oh no, this is a fun car. You just don't understand why Buick LaCrosse is so entertaining. (laughs) Um, We're sticking to a $15,000 budget and we're using a, we're going to use Kelly Blue Book as a reference for that. So good condition, 85,000 miles. It's got to come in under that budget. And no Sebrings <laughs> that goes out there. But more importantly, I think we're going to say no GTIs because the the kind of answer is GTI all the time thing is a little bit boring. So we're going to cut that one out, even though I, I think we could all agree that a GTI would be a fine answer to this question. Can I ask a question? Because in your original um, rules, you did have a conditional that if we did pick something that wasn't a manual transmission, that had an automatic, that had two pedals, then it had to all also have one of the other um, qualities, rear wheel drive, eight or more cylinders, convertible top. So that that is it. I'm correct in interpreting that. You are. Yeah. Sorry. I was sort of breezing through it. You're right. So that all that stuff that I listed, like anything with a manual transmission can count in my, in my world. Um, if, if you're an automatic, then you have to have something else that makes it really fun. And I didn't say another really important part, the part that actually makes it a dad mobile, it's got to have four seats and the seats in back have to be big enough to put a, a car seat in with extra points. Um, if the car is new enough to have the latch system, which are those angles that you can anchor a car seat to. So. I'll really be interested if anybody found a convertible. Uh, so <laughs> that, it, would, it would be a very special convertible uh, if it fits all of those requirements and has a back seat big enough for a baby. Um, all right. So let's um, go around the table and introduce our picks and explain why we chose them. And then the other two editors will get a chance to challenge them. So, Chris, why don't we start with you? Oh, and I want to say beforehand, none of us knows what the other has chosen. Um, so there's there is the possibility for duplicate picks, although I think all of our brains work uh, <laughs> differently enough that that the the chance is, mi- is minimal. Uh, but Chris, we're going to start with you. So why don't you introduce your pick? Sure. Let me just jump in really quick, because really with the uh, the criteria, there there are so many good dad options out there. I mean, there really are, uh, especially if you don't mind going back about 10 years or so. I actually looked at uh, BMW E60 M5, which... Could be could 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 be epic if you don't mind uh, the reliability issues. Um, you could get a, a 2011 Mercedes CLS 550. Great that, pick. And, oh, and that's great pick. and that's a, that checks in just underneath. I didn't pick those. Um, I didn't go with the obvious Subaru WRX, uh, which falls uh, if you go back to like 2010, 2011. You can get in there. I picked probably the most uncharacteristic Chris pick of all time. And that's going to be a 2007 Ford F-150 Harley pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> and here's and now 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 here's why. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have three pedals. But for 2007 2008, they supercharged it. 
It's got 450 horsepower. It's rear wheel drive. It's the super crew. So there's all kinds of room in the back for the baby seat. And then when the baby gets older, there's room in the pickup bed for the bike, for the camping gear. Really? I mean, okay, it's not going to really carve corners very well. But come on, 450 horsepower in that truck, and it's got kind of the Harley stance. It's just, and and if you find one, and they're, they are pretty rare, but if you find one around 85,000 miles, 14,500 bucks. And that truck to this day is still, well, it ties the current uh, EcoBoost F-150 as being the most powerful F-150 ever. Wow. Boom. That is that is an exceptionally unique choice. Um, and uh, I give you a lot of credit for pointing out a vehicle under 15,000 that can get 450 horsepower because Seth and I have played this game a lot of, of how cheap can you get 400 horsepower out on the open market. And um, 450 for under 15,000 is uh, an exceptional equation. I mean, it weighs um, like two and a half tons, but yeah, it I mean, it's, 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 it's got a lot of power. That's plenty of plenty of tire smoking uh, power there. Um, well, also, but, sorry, can I interrupt with one quick caveat here? Yes, uh, for for Mr. Smith, um, I will say, although I, I am enjoying this pick immensely already, <laughs> I think it's a good way to go. For somebody who lives in the Dakotas, where Harley's roam free, and with a strong history and love of the Ford brand, I would say that this is not an unexpected Chris Smith pick. I think this is- <laughs> really. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, think this I, is right I, in your wheelhouse. I, I, I have a blue oval fondness for some things, but honestly, I, I am like the anti truck guy. But I was thinking, okay, I'm not a dad. You're a dad. And I'm trying to think outside the box on this a little bit in that, yeah, I'm going to want something fun to drive, but I'm also thinking about space for all of the dad stuff that I'm going to need, all of the shopping trips. And I'm also thinking of something maybe a little bit bigger, you know, maybe something that might have a little bit more protection around the outside. I was going through Volvos like nobody's business, and I just uh, there are so many nice Volvos, but I just I couldn't bring myself to uh, to, to picking a Volvo, you know. And well, uh, let me let me let me say one thing for it and one thing against it. One thing for it as a dad mobile is that you're you're putting a lot of vehicle around you and your family. So I would think safety is is something in the pro column for the Ford F-150 Harley-Davidson. Because if you're in an accident, you've got the size, you've got inertia, you've got physics uh, backing you up. So you and your baby are probably going to be safe. However, the this particular F-150 was only sold as two-wheel drive and, and, and rear-wheel drive at that. And you live in Ann Arbor, uh, Seth. So I imagine in winter, it's not going to be the greatest vehicle, um, not just because it's rear wheel drive, but because there's not a lot of weight over those rear wheels. You might be sandbagging it in the back just to get some traction. So a little bit of weight and and some good tires definitely would be in order. Not only is that particular trim of the F-150 rare, but this, the supercharger that gets it to 450 horsepower was optional. So it's not even on every Harley Davidson F-150 of that year. So that makes, that's going to make it even harder to find probably. I I, I thought it, I thought it was, I thought for 07 and 08, um, they all came with a supercharger, uh, and actually, it was a Celine deal. I, 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 I could be search. wrong on that. I did a quick search when when you named your pick, and I actually found the Autoblog article from May twenty third, two thousand seven. And I did you write that one, John? Oh my god, I did write it. Coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's excellent. Uh, damn it. This should have been my pick. I should have remembered this from 12 years ago. Uh, but no, I'm reading the I'm reading the press release from that um, that article. That's hilarious. And it, it was optional. Um, you you okay. could get it without the supercharger. So so when you are, are searching for this pick, if this if this turns out to be your uh, your next vehicle, uh, Seth, you will have to make sure that the supercharger comes with it. Absolutely. And I think that that is the, um, you know, if I'm if I'm poking holes here, because again, I think this is a, is a really solid pick. I'm not sure that the Harley truck is necessarily something that I could personally uh, rock every day and feel good about. <laughs> it's really sedate, though. It's not like some of the other Harley trucks that's all that are all loud with their paint jobs. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, it's solid not quite color. as bad. No, no. Is it black and orange? Uh, it's black. Um, actually, I don't think it has any orange on it, does it, John? I don't even think it's black. It's it's single color. Or, or was it, it like a maroon? Like a, yeah, it's it? like a deep, deep, deep purple, almost to the point where you can't even tell it's purple. 
Does it give you a sudden and inexplicable desire to wear acid wash jeans? No, I would say it was a great, um, very minimalist era of the F-150. Um, the badging is tasteful. Hon- honestly, th- this is probably one of the best Harley Davidsons there were. And okay. if, um, if you're smart about it, because they were so rare, um, you're probably not going to find them any cheaper going forward this is probably the bottom of the depreciation curve for that well, truck so there you go a little bit of financial advice from uh from chris as well <laughs> that was that was my point the point that i was going to make chris i think if i can get one at the 14 and change that you you specified kelly blue book is great for mass market cars and my experience is that with these really like special trims or sought after variants like a lot of times it's a little bit off so I would think that actually finding one under 15 might with the supercharger might be a lot more challenging than than looking up the price. Um, but yeah, if you could get it there, it seems like you could you could hold on to your money pretty well. Yeah. I mean, and you're not wrong. It, it, it would be a tough vehicle to find like just the right one. Exactly. Well, if, it, if it's going to appreciate, then I think that gives you license to take some of the child's um, college fund, put it into the truck. It'll be a safe financial vehicle for it over time. So maybe you can raise the raise the um, the maximum amount you're willing to spend. And you, you would be the coolest dad among all the other dads because you would have this this big, badass Harley pickup truck, you know? I like the idea of physically putting my child's college fund into the back of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the baby was just born, so there's probably only about thirty dollars in that fund. So there's not, there's not a lot. Jack, yeah. listening to this, uh, bear with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, excellent pick, Chris. Uh, I'm gonna have a really hard time topping that, um, especially because I think when you hear my pick, unlike Chris, you're gonna say, "I totally knew you were gonna say that, John." Um, my pick. As a matter, I have two vehicles. Um, if you guys would let me, I'd like to. I'd like to mention them both, but I have chosen one over the other. Um, the, the one I've chosen as the as the one I'm I'm going to recommend as my choice is the first generation Chrysler 300 SRT8. Ooh, um, <laughs> I thought and, about and that. I, I thought about that. Seth, you're laughing because this was a vehicle you did um, a top 10 post for Motor One in the early days of what was it? Um, highest horsepower cars under $20,000? Yeah, that sounds correct. I yeah. Love SRT works out really well in this uh, uh, horsepower per dollar index. Yeah, for some reason, the value of the 300, the Chrysler 300 SRT um, vehicles fell, ha- has fallen a lot farther than their Dodge counterparts. Um, so you can pick up one of these first gen 300 SRT8s for under 15,000, under 100,000 miles, you know, 85, um, easily. Like they're, and, and really good examples, not like, you know, be- beaten to hell ones. Um, I think. That generation of 300 um, was an awesome design, so imposing, um, a, a great looker. Um, also, the SRT seats of that generation were what, some of my favorite seats of all time. They were they had big bolsters, they kept you in place, but they were supremely comfortable. So if this is going to be your daily, daily driver, uh, I think it'd be very comfortable, especially for a guy like you who is um, tall of height. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the seats are great. The seats are phenomenal. They're they're sort of overstuffed, and I would say um, the biggest issue with the, this car, this generation of three hundred, for me is uh, I don't like the point about it aging well. The styling aging well might be a little bit dicey. This one, this one feels very of a period to me, um, and especially that interior. It's just. It's the type of the type of space that's just begging to be scratched up and nicked up. And even if the the photos look good, I have a feeling this is the kind of car you get into and you're like, who's been in here with like finishing nails just running them <laughs> off? That is true. It, it, it is the 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 dashboard is kind of like the vertical face of El Capitan, um, <laughs> and and all hard plastic. Yeah. Um, however, it. The even though plastic. the hardest, yeah. E- even though it's an it's an older vehicle, I mean, it was made uh, like pre two thousand ten. Um, you could get it with a, a nav system, an early generation nav system. Um, I don't think that's a selling point, but just mentioning it. Um, and four hundred and twenty five horsepower, you're easily zero to sixty times in the four second range uh, with this. Um, so let me let me throw out my well. 
first of all, let me, Chris, do you have any thoughts on, on this choice? Oh, uh, you know, I, I was looking at the 300 SRTs and I was even thinking about the, uh, some of the charger SRTs. Ah, I just, there's just something about those cars that never really sat that well with me. I mean, I've driven the older 300s and I, I don't like the interiors. Um, I think the styling is kind of dated, uh, Seth, like you were talking about. It just, it, it's just not a car that would click with me right away if I was looking for something cheap as a, uh, you know, a, a, a cheap, older, high performance fun sedan. You know, it's just, uh, it just, just, it has that high boy look that, looked good at the time but now it's just like it's 2019 man it's not uh it's not 2007 says the guy who picked the harley davidson edition <laughs> that's, <laughs> F-150. That's, that's a timeless <laughs> truck a yeah. timeless truck <laughs> that is the most um of its time uh vehicle i mean i can basically pick the year just by looking at the color scheme on an f-150 harley davidson <laughs> Um, I, I, I heartily disagree with you both. I think a, a very good condition 300 SRT eight looks imposing, impressive to this day. It, um, it was, it was a great design. I'm not going to call it timeless, but it, it was definitely, I think, uh, imp- impressive design of the time that, that I certainly wouldn't mind, uh, driving around today. Oh, I mean, you could even consider, um, something a little bit rarer, like, um, a Dodge Magnum SRT eight. Uh, but I'm pretty sure those values are higher. Um, and you're not going to find one easily for under 15. Um, you could also be really weird and get a Magnum SRT eight and graft the Chrysler 300 front end onto it and then have a Franken car that nobody knows what it is. Well, no, I was just going to ask whether or not we have room in our budget with the with the 300 to add a uh, a truly timeless Bentley grill. <laughs> probably, yes. You could probably, I mean, you know, like a yeah, yeah like a gold-plated Bentley grill. I bet you could probably um, find one already installed and not even have to look that hard for it. Yeah, man, I live in Detroit. <laughs> I can find that car. Probably, probably. All right, let me let me make a quick um, honorable mention. My other one was going to be just a favorite car of mine that I I always have on my Google Alerts, which is the Pontiac G8 GT. And I was a little nervous when I was looking it up because I didn't know if the the GT models prices had fallen below fifteen thousand. Uh, but with your rules, with an eighty five thousand mile uh, target. Uh, it does. You can get uh, G8 GTs. The problem is there's not a lot of them left either unmolested, like unmodified, or um, just not beaten beaten to hell. Um, so usually when you do find really good ones, their prices are a little higher. But this is a vehicle in a very similar vein to the 300 SRT8 rear-wheel drive, uh, big V8. This one had less horsepower, but it was still tons of fun to drive. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be, I think it'd actually be harder to find one of these, um, than, than the SR, than the 300 SRT8. Which was the G8 that had the, um, the manual, the manual. Was it- yeah, that was the G8 GXP and values on those are just silly. Those are like upper $20,000 still. Really? Yeah. Um, wow. yeah, yeah. Cause they, they, at the time they were the only ones with the manual. Um, and they've sold in very low numbers. Um, they had uh, some other performance upgrade. They had much larger wheels. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so you could look for them, but I don't think you're going to find one even under twenty. That's um, that's interesting because as I was looking, I was looking at the uh, the new or the later model Chevy SS, which is kind of the same thing. The big Holden from Australia, um, but those right now are trending in like the low to mid twenties, um, a little bit above the budget. But man, that's that'd be a car that I would stretch out a little bit more for. Uh, just to have the the big rear wheel drive V eight yeah. manual. Well, you could you could probably find a Chevy SS cop car at auction that would be under your fifteen thousand mile range. <laughs> no Come kid wants cop, to ride in suspension. a cop car. That is not cool. Cop brakes, cop <laughs> transmission. That thing would last forever. Um, let me just say, uh, as a side note here, the uh, Crown Vic option has been presented and. Hard veto from <laughs> hard pass. Hard, the, wait, wait, wait. What about um, um, Grand Marquis? What was the what was the Mercury? The Mercury Marauder. 
Yep, it won't matter. It'll look okay. the same to her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. I see who's who's exercising their veto option. Yeah, no, I'd be all about a Marauder or maybe even even a Crown Vic. In fact, I received a trade offer that we can maybe talk about later for a Crown Vic with a manual swap in it, uh, with like a Tremec from a... <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that sounds, that sounds reliable. I, ne- yeah. I need to know more about that after the call. <laughs> Offline. I'll pass on his information. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. So I've got my, I got my two picks out. Um, now Seth, I'm most interested in yours since you're the one who's going to have his money on the line. You've been thinking about this longer than we have. So Mm -hmm. what, uh, what is your top pick, um, for the dad fun mobile? Okay. So I've, I've got two, two, but I'll, I'll go over the first one in brief because, um, the, uh, one thing that happens when you're shopping for cars like this, as you guys both well know, I'm sure, is availability plays a huge part. So if something is available in Southern California, which is where most of the good stuff lives, it adds a, a significant wrinkle to actually bringing it home and driving it, right? Uh, so I have two, one being one that is not widely available and the other one which is pretty thick on the ground and, and a lot of fun. Um, so the dream pick, and and stay with me here, actually kind of follows along the same mindset that you guys both had, which is large, um, very bottom of the depreciation curve, tons of power, rear wheel drive, automatic transmission, right? Okay. Mine just happens to be Italian, have a Ferrari engine in it. Oh, oh no. And and, uh, be badged Maserati. I love it. I love it. (laughs) I love it. So as it turns out, the it looks like, what are they calling this? The fifth generation Quattroporte, um, which had the 4.2 liter uh, Ferrari V8 um, from, from several applications of the era and one truly awful transmission and one pretty reasonable automatic transmission um, can be ha- had right around that range. Specifically, I would be looking for a QP um, from 2007 or later, if you could get one, because 2007 is where they actually fitted it with an, a, a regular torque converted automatic and they got rid of the, uh, what, what was it called? Duo Select, I think, the single clutch six B, which was pretty terrible to use. But also if you, if you sort of follow these things in forums and things like that has a wear of about, or uh, a lifespan of about 20,000 miles. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you, you don't really, want to be you don't want to be spending the college fund on a new transmission. No, I mean even if you get and that's the thing. Even if you bought one today with a brand new transmission and under your fifteen thousand dollar cap, you're just on borrowed time with it. Yeah, the, the <laughs> uh, college fund would be maintenance for the next year and a half. I mean, let's be well, honest there. I talked to a few people who know a, a lot more about these things than I do when I was really looking at it seriously for about a week there, and uh, and I guess the rest of the car is actually pretty good. There there are little odds and ends that go wrong, but powertrain stuff. If you again, if you get the um, if you get the ZF six speed automatic transmission, powertrain is pretty solid. Doesn't have a lot of issues. Um, there aren't a lot of those little sort of annoying things that break down on the car, like you'd find on or you might expect from an Italian car uh, that's that's fifteen years old or ten years old. Um, so it's not quite as bad as you'd expect. The big deal is that when something does happen. One, I'm not fixing it myself, and two, you're going to pay um, massive labor rates to get anything worked on with the car. So, um, so I don't think it's completely impractical, and certainly it's really stylish. I, I have a, a soft spot for this weird sort of soft nose, uh, high high rear roofline car. Um, the interiors are absolutely gorgeous, even though they have the. I remember the first one of these I drove. I I was convinced and remain convinced that it's the worst infotainment screen or a uh, uh, system that I've ever used in my entire life. Um, but you're talking about Italian leather and really nice carpets and beautiful wood and nice bright work and cool wheels and all the stuff that you would expect to get with a Maserati are still there and usually in great condition. It's hard to find one of these that has more than 50,000 miles on it. How, how is the, how is the engine the, note? Oh, uh, unbelievable. I mean, the, 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 yeah, the, that 4.2 just sings, it revs up to, God, what is the red line? I mean, certainly around 8,000, 9,000 RPM. Um, What's the service uh, interval on that engine? <laughs> A great question that I can't answer. I have no idea. <laughs> um, weekly, I would imagine. Uh, no, I don't. I, I, again, I don't think the engine is a problem, uh, at least not if you if you believe people who are actually owners and reporting it on forums um, and, and a couple of people I've talked to who, who write about uh, old cars. I don't think the engine is an issue um, and it sounds amazing. So can I can I give you a pro tip? 
Sure. Um, so as some people know, the, the motor one.com headquarters are in Miami, Florida, and I don't think there's anywhere where the Quattro Porte is thicker on the ground than Miami. I once described it to somebody as the Camry of Miami because <laughs> I, I, Seth, you've been to Miami, you've been to the headquarters a number of times. People mm-hmm. in Miami just like to pretend they're wealthier and cooler than they really are. So the people who can't afford the actual nice luxury cars, they go for used Quattro Portes. They are all over the place. Uh, down there. So do a, do a, try, try a search down there and you might find a good um, selection to choose from. I like it. I like it. No rust either. <laughs> um, okay. So that's not my actual pick though. I think the, I think the QP is solid, but ultimately uh, as much as I tease him about it, that Chris is right. I think the service would scare me off. So, so what I'm looking for then is something that's more reliable, right? Something where the service isn't an issue. Um, sticking with four doors, we're moving a little bit newer, and we're moving way, way down the horsepower scale. So my real pick is is far and away the lowest powered car uh, that we've talked about yet today um, at only 232 horsepower. But it's also the only one you'll notice that has a manual transmission. Um, and I think easily the best handling car, not only that, that we're going to discuss, but really one of the best handling cars that I've ever driven and are driven. And that is a 2011 Mazda RX-8 R3. Whoa, wow. I did not see that coming. Yeah, yeah, Wait, what about reliability? Yeah, that's, uh, the, <laughs> thanks for chiming in there, John. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's what's on everyone's mind. You're going to have to have an oil fund. Uh, well, you, you'll notice that there's nothing in the rules about reliability. Just, just True. Just defines fun. So I'm not breaking any rules there. I've got four seats. In fact, uh, I've even I've even test driven a few of these cars, and I know that my own personal rear-facing car seat, which is a lot harder to fit, fits in the back. Um, I fit just fine up front. Uh, the trunk is a little bit small, so you give up some practicality there. But the thing about the the thing about the RX-8 that you know, everybody thinks about and that it gets a really bad rap for is the rotary engine is unreliable. The rotary engine will blow up. You lose um, the apex seals inside the engine, which effectively uh, cause the the engine to, to not be properly oiled and then it then it dies, right? Um, and, and that's not untrue. Those things have happened certainly a lot more to this car than they've happened to, to a regular piston engine car. But the problem is it's not it's not because of a bad design per se. It's because people bought the car and drove it as if it were a Camry, right? So they filled it up with gas and drove it to work and parked it and never really thought about it. And, and this is a car that requires you to think about what your oil level, um, you know, on a frequent, frequent basis. So, you know, every other, every third uh, trip to the gas station or, or tank fill up, you want to check the oil level to make sure that the, the, you're getting enough oil in the engine that you're keeping those seals nice and um, uh, lubricated and keeping the engine happy. The other thing that can go wrong is, is if you don't uh, really rev the engine out, which is, you know, just a wonderful thing to do. Uh, 85, 8,500, 9,000 wow. or something like that. That is in the clouds. Yeah, it'll also then you also have problems. Then you end up with some uh, some sort of carbon buildup that creates some of the same issues. So it's a car that you can't that you have to pay attention to. But if you're driving an RX-8 as a daily driver, aren't you paying attention to driving anyways? It's a much larger challenge to find one that you can verify someone else was giving it that attention. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I you know if you find the right seller who has. Uh, proof or evidence that that they took care of it well or if you have a mechanic who can give a a thorough enough inspection that they can see you know this one is in is in great shape uh then i think you're you're good to go um one thing uh, i I think it's a great pick totally outside the box um but inside the box as well um and i think that's that's kind of how mazda meant the rx8 to be with the kind of half rear doors and and the usable back seat i think you might have an issue with the trunk space though Um, and like Chris, I don't have kids, but I, I know people who have kids. I'm related to people who have kids. And one big metric by which they judge vehicles is does my stroller fit in in the trunk? And I think that would be a good thing to check, uh, you know, before you, you jump right into an RX-8 because it, it, it also comes down not just to does the trunk fit a stroller, but it's, does the trunk fit my stroller, the, the particular one I bought? 
Um, and, and that can vary. You know, I know people who bought an SUV before they, before they had the kid and then they, you know, somebody gifts them an expensive stroller and it, it doesn't fit. Um, so, so that would be something I would look into. Um, the only other thing I'd say is this car also did a cameo in the second X-Men movie X2. Um, <laughs> and there was a wicked body kit on it. So you should, you should search that body kit out. See if you can see if you can make an awesome movie car out did, of this. Did we I, really get into the Marvel Cinematic Universe here? I don't know. No, this was this was the, during this is the Fox oh, uh, licensing. Okay. I've never. I, I love movie cars. You know, Ecto One, uh, Jurassic Park, Explorers, all that. I've never seen anyone do an RX Eight from X Two uh, as a movie car. So this could double as a family vehicle, a movie car to take to Cars and Coffee, a mm-hmm. fun handling machine. It could do three things in one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I gotta chime in. Uh, full disclosure, I actually and and Seth, I'm, I'm going to actually agree with you here i drove uh, i test drove an rx8 a couple years ago and i almost bought it because it is just so good but i also have to agree with john in that you need to shop the buyer or you need to shop the seller on that car just as much if not more so than the car because it's so so difficult to know how that car was treated ahead of time and seth you're exactly right you you don't drive it as a normal car and people did um you have to rev that rotary out uh you you don't just jump into it drive it for a couple minutes and then park it and shut it off that's that's just uh, a terrible way to treat those cars and uh, if you can find one that's been driven by somebody that knows it's something different and something special it could be a great choice and man you're not wrong about just revving that engine out i i'm not a rotary guy and i almost bought this rx8 and it was it was it wasn't even a stick it was an automatic um then that's how enamored i was with it but then i came to my senses and decided i didn't want a rotary that uh, that needed all that extra fuss <laughs> yeah no you're you're 100 right and one important thing that i've learned so if, if any listeners out there are also considering looking for rx8 number rx8s number one uh wait till i've got one so that we're not <laughs> number two is the one thing that i've read and i fully believe is really important i'm i am 100 percent a proponent of a pre-purchase inspection on any used car that i buy at least unless it's you know like $500. I'm just taking a flyer on something. Um, and for this car, you really need to have a compression check done to make sure. And, and this isn't like a normal compression check either. This is uh, you have to have special equipment is my understanding to be able to check the compression on the rotary. Um, it's, I think that it can run in the neighborhood of a couple hundred bucks to have this done. So it's not insignificant, but I think it will absolutely be a really good leading indicator of whether or not the engine is in good shape and those seals um, that are really precious to keeping the engine firing the way that you want it to uh, are still intact. So um, that's something to consider. You know, I would say if any good examples left probably were taken care of because they wouldn't have lasted this long. Like it's a delicate enough vehicle and, and, and enough time has elapsed that the, the ones that were mistreated, uh, probably, you know, (laughs) met the junkyard, uh, long before now. Um, all, all the ones that I know, all the people that I know that have the RX eight, and I do know a couple are those types of people who know exactly what it is and exactly what care it needs. So, so I don't know, maybe it's not as hard to find as we think, because, you know, if you've got an RX eight today and it's in good condition, chances are, you know, you're part of the community and you know what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. There are a lot of bad ones out there. There are like, for instance, I wouldn't buy a car that was already, already made into an X-Man car. <laughs> well, well, you don't want that fun of the conversion to be taken away from you. So I totally understand that. That's exactly why. You want to save that for yourself. Um, uh, but no, I think that's, that is my number one pick. And, and, you know, specifically, there's so much budget there, too, with 15 grand. I, I called out the the latest model R3, which was the sort of special handling package, uh, bigger wheels. It had a little bit of a wing, so it just looked a little bit more aggressive. But if you're looking for something that's an earlier, even a Gen 1 car, I mean, six $7,000 is all you need to buy something. That's wow, a- the R3 is under 15? Oh, yeah, the R3. I'm, I'm looking at, I, I can't remember if it was, I think I looked 10 or 11 R3 is well under it's it's 13 something wow so wow um, so yeah ton, there's just a ton of value there for somebody who who um can pay attention and, and take care of the car right the one i looked at a few years ago when was it two or three years ago now 
It was only like 4500 or five grand. It needed a little extra help. I felt like the engine was good, but you can find some really good deals on them. The depreciation stick hit the uh, RX-8 pretty hard yeah. uh, over time, <laughs> uh, but which is good for everybody else as long as you can, you can find one that was well taken care of. Um, well, guys, this was incredibly fun. Uh, we haven't done an editor versus editor for a long time, especially not a three-way. Kudos to you guys. I mean, completely unique picks. I did not see any of those cards uh, coming. I think you probably saw mine coming a mile away, though. Actually, no, not at all. John, yeah. John, I'm surprised we didn't just jump in and tell them to buy Torah shows. I was expecting that from mm. like in like the first ten seconds of the, of the conversation. I didn't even think of that. That was I, it, it, honestly the ones I would recommend are, <laughs> I think, older than he would uh, consider. Yeah. And I just I just know Seth, and he would not go for that. <laughs> also, not real wheel drive, so so it didn't didn't have one of the um, requirements. Well, we would love to hear what everybody out there thinks. Um, what would your what would your fun dad mobile be? What would you recommend to Seth? Um, you can let us know on Facebook and Twitter at Motor One Com, as well as on the comments on Motor One Com itself. We'll have this up uh, this podcast up on an article um, where we can continue the discussion uh, in the comments. Coming up, we'll be finding out what we've been driving this week. But before the break, a, r- a quick reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, as well as anywhere else uh, you listen to your favorite podcasts. So please hit subscribe, give us a rating, make sure you never miss a show. Welcome back. During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with you, Chris. So Chris, what are you driving this week? Well, I'll jump back to last week really quick. I, I was driving the Jeep Gladiator last week, and uh, and I'm not much of a truck guy, like I said earlier. Um, and I was in a friend's older Ram over the weekend, and it just it reminded me how much I uh, I actually hate a, a lot of the older trucks, especially. It was like a like a late '90s Ram, and I had a '99 Ram for a little while. Um, but it I remember that you hated that. You got rid of that like like weeks oh, after buying. I, it. You know I. I always loved the styling, the big truck styling of that era Ram, and uh, I actually really like the interior, and I found it was a two-wheel drive uh, half ton, and I was just it, I was just destroyed at how terrible it rode, um, and it's also kind of shown me after driving then the Gladiator, you know, trucks have really come a long way in the last 20, 25 years to, to really, to really become the, the new modern American full size, um, vehicle of choice. It, it replaces. I mean, the, the gladiators, the gladiator is not even a good representation of that. And, and, get in, and, 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 get in and a new not, Ram. Right. Right. Get, yeah, get I, in a new Ram and it's like driving a car. Oh yeah. No, I've, I've, I haven't had a chance to drive the new Ram yet. I've been in the new F one fifties and the new, uh, the new Silverados. And uh, it's it's just a night and day difference. But that was that was my drive experience. Just a reminder that old trucks, yeah, I'm, I'm just not there. But uh, they've they've definitely come a long way. Yeah, for sure. All right, Seth, what are what are you driving this week? So I've been trying to get as much time as possible in the car that I am actually actively trying to sell right now to fund the uh, Dadmobile project, which is my 1998 Porsche Boxster. That's the first 986 Boxer Boxster. And it's the um, it it was the base model, so non S. It had the 2.5 liter flat six engine, five speed manual transmission, in awesome condition. Really, I put new tires on it last year. Actually, I think one of the one of the last uh, stories that I wrote for Motor One was was talking about how much uh, great new tires can transform uh, uh, an older car, and and we wrote about the Boxster then. So. I really, really loved it. I've been, it's, we've had great weather for the last week or so uh, in Michigan, a few rainy days, but really a lot warmer weather. So uh, I've been driving the, driving the hell out of it and it's on a, on a good road. It's, it's still one of my favorite cars of all time. Yeah, that was a really great vehicle. Uh, I remember when you got it and it's, it's, it's probably a really great vehicle to have as your last one before fatherhood uh and and you know <laughs> before you have to get something that fits a car seat uh, i never got to get a ride in it so i'll always uh be sad about that but um well but it's, yeah. still, it's still around around so maybe if you <laughs> if, if you, i hurry up yeah if you hurry up we might be able to get you a drive in it uh, all right very cool it's, it's a blast 
So my what I've been driving this week, last week, um, I told everyone about the BMW M2 uh, that I had, which was very, very fun um, and and really one of the most fun uh, BMWs I've driven uh, until this week, uh, because this week I have the BMW M5 competition, which it is it. It is a, a, I don't know if it's a supercar or a hypercar, but it's one of those two with four doors. It is insanity in the form of a sedan. And and what I find f- kind of fun and interesting about it is when you get in it and you turn it on and it's just in, in all standard mode, it's got all the nannies turned on um, and all the suspension steering and, and throttle settings on normal. It's just it's very luxury car like the only hint you can feel while driving uh, that it's not uh, uh, just a regular luxury car is the ride is a little stiffer than normal, even on its softest setting. But I have I've had it for a few days and I've, I've had a chance to turn off every electronic nanny and turn up every um, M um, option or, or variable, you know, the, the, like I said, the steering and, and all of that. Um, and it is frightening. I mean, it, 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 it gives me that fear of, of a car of like, you are holding a dangerous weapon. Be very, very careful. Um, this thing, it has 617 horsepower, zero to 60 in 3.1 seconds, which I know, I know a Model S could beat that, but I don't think any, any gas powered sedan comes close to that for 3.1 for zero to 60. Um, so I, I've got the whole weekend ahead of me, uh, and I'm excited about that. Uh, but like I said, it's it's like like a like a genuine supercar. Like I'm approaching it cautiously and nervously, and, and trying to be very careful with it. I need to find like a a runway or something where I'm not going to hit anything, just so I can do some some straight runs and and get it out of my system. John, I I drove that M5, not the competition, but the standard. And I'm using air quotes around the word standard here. Uh, M5. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember doing that for, first drive and drove the car on a racetrack. And it is uh, absolutely unbelievable. Just a balls to the wall. Uh, perfect expression, I think, of what BMW M does really, really well. Um, yeah. And the other thing that I thought was phenomenal about the car was the tuning yeah. of the all-wheel drive system so that it basically felt like a rear-wheel drive car when you needed it to um, was was absolutely yeah. I'm amazed because it has three kind of drive modes for the drivetrain, which is it can do like kind of all wheel drive where it's 50 50. It can do rear biased all wheel drive and then it can just shut off the front wheels and go pure rear wheel drive. Um, so I'm a, I haven't gotten a chance to play with that. I need to find like a good stretch of road where I can uh, take it in all three modes. Um, but that's that's very impressive tech. Uh, I was actually uh, driving back from lunch today, and I was behind a really sweet looking Jaguar F Type. Um, and I was looking at it, and I'm like, "Yeah, you're you're a beautiful coupe, you're a sports car, uh, but I'm driving something that would so totally embarrass you, and I can carry five people, and I have a giant trunk. I'm like, why would you? Why would why wouldn't anybody who has the money not buy this car over anything else? It can it can basically do everything it is literally as fast as a supercar if not a hypercar um and is a sedan with a big trunk and is comfortable like it's just mind-boggling um how how they put all these things together um so i obviously i'm i'm very impressed with it and i'm not really finding uh any fault with it yet so what's the see if that changes what's the price on it the here, price, here's, the fault. <laughs> here's the fault. Okay. Yeah. The price as tested is $129,000 and, uh, 129, $595. Actually though, so, I mean, when you compare it to a supercar or a hypercar, exactly. that, that's not a lot of money. It's, it's exactly. really not. I mean, to be able to pull up next to an Aventador that costs, you know, two or three times as much and keep up, if not win in, in a drag race is, is remarkable. So well, I, I, I <laughs> let's be clear. I mean, it's it's close to being like a hypercar, but it's still very heavy. It's still all wheel drive. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't exactly pull off the same thing. I think it's just I think it's more to your first point. Like a car that can is that size that you can drive on a racetrack and feel like Senna is amazing. But it doesn't it doesn't put it in exactly the same class as McLaren and Lambo and and Ferrari. Maybe maybe not hypercar. Let's keep it to supercar. And I don't even know if I'd put Aventador into hypercar territory. I put Aventador like at top of supercar territory. But yeah. fair fair I, enough. Fair enough. I got a little too liberal. <laughs> um, a little too hyperbolic. I'm I am want to do that. 
Um, all right, so that brings us to the end of our show. Um, you can follow Seth on Twitter at Seth. Um, that is Seth with a Y, S E Y T H. Um, you can follow Chris at C H Writing and me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, thank you two for being here. Pleasure. Thanks, guys. It was really fun. Yep, and thank you all of there out there for listening. Uh, we'll see you next week.